before that. If you have your Bibles, open to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. We want to continue on in our, in our theme for this year, which is, help me here, the three words, help me, I believe God. Yeah, ask a question tonight, like I posed last week, a rhetorical question or a silent question. This does not require an external answer. The question is this, do you really believe God? Not if you claim to believe God, not if you say you believe God, not if you just show up at church, but do you really hear, believe God? I can't answer that for you, only you can answer that question. Just reminded that the Bible says, without faith, without this belief in God, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. You can't even do it. You can't come close. You can't even begin uh, to walk down that road of pleasing God without faith, without this choice to believe God. Last, Last week, we looked at in Acts chapter 27, the tremendous and terrible storm that Paul was thrust into. He found out in Acts chapter 23 uh, that he was going to stand before Caesar in Rome. In Acts chapter 25 and 26, he stands before Augusta and Festus, and he then appeals to Caesar, and to Caesar he must go. Acts chapter 27, he begins in verse number 1. They now get on the ship with Julius the centurion, and they go to another place, and they jump on with a new shipmaster. And then along the way, they're cast into this horrendous storm. In fact, the Bible, in verse number 14 of Acts chapter 27, uses these two two words, tempestuous wind, which I explained is is where we get our word typhoon from, typhoonicus, which in the Greek language was the strongest word for any storm possible. Luke is telling us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that this was not just any storm. This was not just a little storm. This was the storm of the century. This was the storm of all storms. It was the worst thing possible. You ever feel like what you're going through is the worst storm possible? That no one else has it as bad as you do? Well, we may not say that, but if we're honest, we feel that way sometimes. Someone said this, Every man deems that he has precisely the trials and temptations which are the hardest of all others for him to bear. But then the quote went on to say this, and I love this, but they are so. See, normally we finish that with saying, listen, whatever you have, someone's got it worse. You may be in a full body cast and and this and that, but someone's got it worse. And you sit there, and I sit there, and we think, yeah, someone maybe does, but how can that be possible? And I feel for them, because I got it really, really, really bad. This person who said this quote said that we deem what we go through to be the hardest of all to bear, and they are so because, simply, they are the very ones that you and I need the most. You see, God often brings us to the point that he knows we need to grow in. And tonight, I want to look at what happens after Paul chooses to announce once again his belief in God. You see, Paul did not always believe God. Early on in his life, he thought he did. He was on a mission as he traveled from city to city committing Christians into prison. He stood by holding coats while there was a stoning. Then on the road to Damascus, you know the story, on the road to Damascus, he met with Jesus. And he met with him face to face. He walked away and became after that a changed man. He was different than before, but his reputation preceded him. The the, the Christians there were afraid to bring him over because they'd heard what this man had done and they did not put it past him with deceit. But he had chosen back then to believe God throughout his ministry. By the time this particular story takes place, he had gone on two to three different missionary journeys. He'd already been through a shipwreck already. He had been beaten a few different times. He had to run for his life. He had already chosen to to believe God before, but he had to again, he had to again make the choice. You ever feel like you're learning the same lesson over and over and over? Or is it just me? Maybe it's just me. It's like, Lord, do I have to learn this one about faith all over you? Do I have to learn this one about this, or this, whatever it may be? And, and it's like, man. But that's not the time to quit. And, and I want to see in the story what happened because we know that the storm was bad. It was terrible. And then in verse number 22 of Acts chapter 27, we find a passage. And now Paul says, I exhort you to be of good cheer. 
Paul says, listen, I know the storm's raging around you, but be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. I mentioned last week, and I want to remind us again, don't ever, don't ever look for more or rejoice more for the ship than the passengers. Right? We often get caught up with these things down here. This is just the ship. All right? Our life here is just a ship down here. All right, we're, we're trying to set things further on. We have different goals than what is down here, our job and our house and our cars and our bank accounts. That's just the ship. And sometimes those get blown up. And Paul says, be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me, verse 23, uh, this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that it shall be even as it was told me, howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. Lord, I thank you for this passage, for this particular concept, again, that Paul challenges us to, Lord, by his example and in your word. I pray that you would help me as I speak tonight to have those things that would be profitable, that would be true to your word, Lord, but help our hearts to be challenged and touched by your spirit. And Lord, there may be one or more here who have again faced the choice whether to believe what they see, what they feel, or to believe you. And Lord, I ask for your help in our choice to believe you. Lord, I can't know all of the situations here, but you do. Lord, I don't believe that this theme and these verses are an accident because nothing in your plan is an accident. So, Lord, please help us this time. Turn our hearts towards you. May we respond the way we ought to in Jesus' name. Amen. What happens after we make our choice to believe God? What happens when we finally decide to stand up to a corrupt boss or a corrupt situation? What happens when we finally decide to take the right stand and walk by faith? And what happens when we really start to lock in and spend some time with God? What happens when we decide to be a faithful steward, start honoring the Lord, and begin to give our tithe to the Lord? What happens? Often, the storm continues. You know, we want to live life sometimes like Disney or the Hallmark Channel. Where everyone lives life happily, help me, ever after. You know how the stories go. Person A marries person B. There's some type of conflict. They make the right choice, right? And then they ride off in the sunset, and you don't hear of them ever again. It's wonderful, and there's no more conflict. If they were a, a prince or a, a prince charming and a, and a princess, I'm sure, they never had an argument the rest of their married life, I'm sure. Never had a financial burden, no problems. Though the whole prior story was full of conflict, after this point there was no conflict. Happily ever after. I read an interesting article about someone who was talking about that in the Hallmark Channel. And they said that it's good to sometimes escape reality and watch 90 minutes of Cinderella happily ever after. I reject that right now, just categorically reject it. But it's interesting, even in that analogy, in that, in that little pithy thing they were talking about, that they understand that that's not reality. They said you can escape reality for 90 minutes because most of us know that the storm often continues. Now, once again, to remind you, I am typically an optimist. All right, some of you, again, decided last week after I talked about some of your, quote, realism or pessimism, whatever you want to call it, uh, to remind me that that's, that's what I need in my life. All right, fine, I'm glad you're there to bring me back to reality, but I like to live my life trusting in God, amen? Amen. Thank you, all right? (laughs) Uh, But the fact is, not every story in life ends like a movie or a book. Not everyone looks like the hallmark happily ever after in a quaint little town and problems dissolve and a a frog is kissed and becomes a, a prince. But yet in one sense, we have a happily ever after, do we not, in a long term sense? This world is not my home. We're not home yet. Jesus is going to come back to take us to our home, and and the best is yet to come. All right, that's a wonderful reality that sometimes escapes our thinking because the storm just feels like it keeps on. Picture yourself here in Acts chapter 27. Paul has just given a rousing speech. 
He's saying, cheer up, cheer up. I stood with an angel of God last night, announcing this to the 275 other pastors on the boat. No doubt they all are captivated by his speech now, and he claimed this man whom they for sure had heard about before. Paul was a well-known figure throughout the, the, the Greek, throughout the different areas because of his, 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 um, the problems that his preaching caused. He was well-known. And no doubt they listened as he said, an angel of God stood before me. He, he captivated their attention and gave a rousing speech. He said, don't worry, we're all going to be okay. And we're going to lose the ship, but you're going to be okay. So don't worry, we're going to be cast upon an island. Can you kind of feel the anticipation? Okay, what's going to happen next? They look around. And the wind's still howling. The boat is still being driven, like verse 15 tells us, whichever way the boat wants to go. The men aren't driving the ship any longer. The wind is driving the ship. And they're eagerly waiting. Is there going to be a big flash of lightning? Is a, a hand from the sky going to come down and pick up the boat? And, 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 and what, what's going to happen? And nothing happens. Except more storm. Except more storm. What do you do? What do you do? What do I do when there's just more storm? Well, look at here. It was bad. That's my first point tonight. If you're taking notes, it was bad. And Paul says it's going to get bad. He says, don't worry. The storm may be bad, and we're going to have a shipwreck. Well, thanks, Paul. That's a great, you know, I, I would have liked to say, you know what, what's going to happen? We're going to get in a, in a special wind. It's going to pick us up. And, but no, we're going to have a shipwreck. Well, that's wonderful. Hey, hey let, let me explain a little like this. You come and you say, listen, Pastor, you know, it's stewardship month, and I, I've not been giving before. So I'm going to give. So I believe, God, I'm going to give. Good. You're going to have a bankruptcy. Okay. Okay, Pastor. Maybe you didn't hear what I said. I'm, I'm going to start giving to God, right? Right. That's fine. You're going to have a bankruptcy. And you're going to lose your house. It's going to be smashed into pieces. Oh, and your livelihood. He just told the captain his livelihood is going to be smashed into pieces too. Okay. So you choose to believe God and my livelihood gets smashed. This is not good news. All right, at first glance, we would say, this is not a good turn in the story. This does not help people turn to God. This is not, you know, Lord, we'll, we'll help you write a good story. All right, let, have Paul raise his arms up and command the wind and the sea to be still. Could God do that? Oh, <laughs> in a split second, he could. Why didn't he? I'm, I'm going to get to the end of my sermon real quick. Because God's always got a better way than I've got. All right? Now, I look at it and be like, that's a great way, Paul. You know, but that's not what he does. He announces we're going to have a shipwreck. It gets bad. Despair says it always gets darkest just before it fades to pitch black. <laughs> Let that sink in. <laughs> it always gets darkest right before it fades to pitch black. And sometimes that's how we feel in this life. We say, God, I listened to you. I, I found it in the preaching. I found it in your word or through a friend or through another godly Christian. Lord, I choose to trust you. And, and you're on fire. You're excited. Kind of, boom, the lights get turned out. It gets bad. If we look at the next verse, it tells us in verse 27 of Acts 27, but when the 14th night was come, they'd now been at this for 14 nights. We remember previously that they had already decided that all hope in verse 20 was taken away. 14 nights had taken place as we were driven up and down in Adria. About midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Verse 29, then fearing, lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. You catch that? They just wished for the day. They just wished for some light, just for some little reprieve. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion, to Julius, and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. At this point, there is now no backup plan. No more lifeboats. 
No more lifeboats. Now remember, Paul had previously said, we're going we're gonna to lose the ship, but we're all going to make it. We're going to be cast upon an island. No doubt they had thought, well, these lifeboats will get us to that island. Once the ship is gone, we've got these boats. And, and that's how we think. We think, well, th- it'll be okay, and, and this may be bad, but, but I've got this account over here. I've still got my health. I've got this job over here. I've got this backup plan. And then they get cut. No more backup plan. See, my first point was it was bad. My second point tonight is this. It got worse. Just what the Bible says, it got worse. There's no backup plan. You look in verse 33, and while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meek, saying, This day is the 14th day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. They've not eaten, the Bible tells us, for 14 days. Man, some of us can't go two minutes, teenagers. All right, by the time lunchtime hits on a day, you're like, it was lunch, chapel's killing me. 14 days. Hope was gone. Lifeboats are cut. It got worse. They were starving. It got worse. Verse 41 tells us there was a shipwreck and falling into a place where two seas met. They ran the ship aground, and the fore part stuck fast, and they remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. They were starving. They finally had the shipwreck, but they survived. Look with me in those next couple verses. They survived in verse 42. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which should swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. Verse 44 is going to be a message one day. I won't stand it long, but look at it. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. None of them had a boat, some had a board, but some just had a broken piece of the ship. I can identify with that, and so can you, that sometimes you're like, man, all I've got from the Lord, it seems like, is a little broken piece of a ship. Not even a big piece, just a little piece. But can I draw your attention to this, that last part of that verse? And it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. It didn't matter whether they were on a board or a broken piece of the ship or the ship or the lifeboat. didn't matter. They all got there safely. What God said would happen always will happen. And God said they'd all get safely there, and they did. But he didn't say how they'd get there. So Christian, fellow Christian, and myself at the same time, Don't get discouraged when how you get there is not how you want to get there. Don't be discouraged when when God says, you're going to go there on a broken piece. Oh, yay. Just what I always wanted, a broken piece. Because a broken piece in God's hand was just as secure as a ship. And the ship out of God's hand was a lot less safe than a broken piece in God's hand. No people have served God for their life. They seem to always have a broken piece. Always just make it to the next point. Just one more step. One more. Sometimes you feel badly for them as a fellow Christian. Like, Lord, why can't they catch a break? Well, why can't, you know, even in our, in our, in our mind, we're like, Lord, I'll, I'll take some of the pain for them. But God says, no, for them. I've got a broken piece. And that broken piece in my hand will get them safely where I want them to go. So don't worry. Don't be discouraged. All right, don't be disheartened because you will get there. When all you get is a piece, don't be discouraged. You'll be okay. You'll be safe. Don't get frightened because the peace is strong enough. And don't grow faint because God is still in control. It got bad and it got worse. They were starving there was a shipwreck. There was some survival. And I got one more S for us because it got worse. They get to this island. I imagine in my mind they did a count. One, two, three, four, especially these soldiers because if they lost a prisoner again, they would sacrifice their life for the prisoners. They got the total count, 276. They're cold. They're wet. The last thing, they get around the fire And wouldn't you know it, Paul gets bit by a snake. 
can it get any worse? I've been in a storm, Lord. I've survived barely by not eating. I just went through a shipwreck. I got a broken piece of the ship, and now I get bit by a snake. First, one could say, boy, you serve a rotten God. But they would speak too soon. They would speak too early. You know what happened, chapter 28, beginning of the chapter. The islanders, the indigenous people of that island, watched Paul. They said, he must be a terrible criminal. Now remember, the other criminals with Paul were probably very terrible criminals. They made the right assumption because they saw this group of of prisoners, most likely men, and they were not punished locally. They were sent to Rome to be punished. So the the historians and scholars tell us that these prisoners had done things, most likely murder, of such great offense that they were now going to be executed at Rome. And Paul was among them. So when this happened, it was natural that they thought, this one must have been one of the worst because even the gods wouldn't let him get to Rome. His judgment becomes now. He flings the snake off into the fire. Oh boy, I can't ever catch a break in life. How do you respond in the storm when you're in a shipwreck? All you get is a piece, and then you get bit by a poisonous viper. For some, that's all it takes. Have a stinking, rotten attitude. Some at that point, that choice to believe God that we found early in chapter 27 is now off. I did believe you, God, but now not so much. But see, now the story takes an incredible turn. Because we look on the outside and we think it looks bad. We look on the outside and think nothing is happening. All is hopeless. But can you hear the words of Paul echoing throughout the ages? But... I believe God. And God said that I'd stand before Caesar. He told me in Acts 23, told me in Acts 27. So whatever happens with this viper, it's going to be okay. If Caesar's showing up in the next five minutes, that's okay. I'm going to stand before him. I believe God. He gave me some promises. They're still true. They're not fulfilled yet. So I believe him. You think nothing's happening. On July 4th, 1776, significant date in the American history. King George of England entered into his diary this phrase, nothing of significance happened today. And sometimes in our minds, we think, well, nothing of significance happened today. When in reality, because we're trusting in the God of the universe... One of our greatest moments has now happened. My last one is this. It was bad, it got worse, and now it became amazing. Simple outline, it became amazing. What happened? God had a special plan. Verses 8 and 9, that that what happened is that the people in God's special plan begin to respond. The the islanders begin to respond, and one of them uh, lay sick of a fever. And, And Paul entered in and prayed, verse 8 tells us in chapter 28, laid his hands on him and healed him. When that happened, others came and said, whoa, 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 what happened? Not only, he, he's a God now, he can, he can do these strange things and amazing things. And, and God began to show and now reveal to Paul and to those around him the plan. See, God's plan was for people's lives to be touched with the gospel. You know why it's important for you and I to believe God this year? Because God has a plan for people this year. God has a plan for people in Saginaw, Michigan, in Bridgeport Township, in Birch Run, all around us. God has a plan for people, and if we make the choice to believe God, to believe God, to believe God, God has a plan for people. He shared the gospel. He healed, he prayed. From there, God took it, did a couple special things. You would notice with him two verses, one in verse 10. It says, Who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they laid at us with such things as were necessary. They went to this island where they thought they were going to get eaten alive, where they thought they'd be destroyed. When they left the island, they were loaded up with gifts and food and everything they needed for the journey. 
They, they, they threw all the provision to the ocean, and God had another storehouse ready for them to refill their supplies. That's the way God works. They couldn't have anticipated that island to stop on, but God had a plan. Often in our life, God will solve it. And when you look back, you'll say, wow, God, you had planned this all the way along. I don't even know about it. And often we find out God planned it even before we had the need. It was already in motion. But I saw something else in this passage that really touched my heart. It's verse number 14 of Acts chapter 28, where it says, Where we found brethren, and were desired to tarry with them seven days, and so we went toward Rome. Now don't miss this, because I've missed this before. They're on a ship going to Rome. They get shipwrecked. They go to an island. They minister on the island. They get back on the ship. That's verse, 40, or verse 11, 12, and 13. And verse 14 is stuck in there that somehow they go along the way and they find some brethren and tarried with them seven days. But understand something. They have not come across any other people besides the people that are on the boat. The soldiers and the criminals and the sailors. So I ask this question, when Paul says, where we found a brethren, who is the we in that verse? Because when this thing started, there was just Paul who was a Christian on this boat. Come on, you hear me now? It's just Paul up there. Paul's the one preaching. And now when we get after this island, now we've got at least one more person who's trusted Christ. But I'll, let me give this to you. I'll say this in verse 24 of Acts chapter 27. The angel of the Lord says to Paul, And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Some would argue they'd all be saved, or they'd all be safe from the shipwreck. I would argue that God was promising an eternal promise right there. And when he says, We found these brethren, I, I would argue that that entire boatload of individuals who had seen the hand of God over and over now were that we found brethren. And the whole boat who's going to Rome stops and tarries for seven days. For what purpose? It tells us to be with other Christians. The whole boat stops seven days just to hang out with some fellow Christians. Now, come on now. That's cool. This boat started over here. They got delayed, 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 shipwrecked, island. And now we're making a pit stop to have some fellowship. They maybe had a potluck. I don't know what they did for seven days. They did something where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. What is God doing? <laughs> a whole lot more than you and I can ever see. Vasco da Gama was one of the early explorers when he went through a place that was previously called the Cape of Storms. He changed that place in the coast of South Africa to the Cape of Good Hope. For where others saw storms, he ahead saw him the jewels and treasures of India. I wonder if in your life where you see a storm, God sees a place of good hope. The storm may be bad, and make it even worse. If you and I make that choice to believe God, we can see God's special plan. His way is always better than your my way. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your strength in our life, how you work all things together according to your plan, Lord. Lord, sometimes in our feeble, carnal minds, we don't see that. We can get discouraged. Lord, may we not lose heart. May we again, like Paul, claim our trust in you. In a minute, the instruments will play. We'll stand to our feet. And I wonder if maybe God has touched your heart tonight. Paul, I believe, again, during the storm, had to make that choice to believe God, and he did. In your life and in my life, there'll be those times the storm gets bad. That we have to again say, but God, I believe you. In a moment, we'll stand. Instruments will play.
God's touched your heart. Can I encourage you? Can I exhort you? Believe God again, because what he has is amazing. Lord, bless this invitation. May we respond the way you've touched our heart. In Jesus' name.